All right, so this whole section is going to focus on ecology, but more specifically the actual energy flow in an ecosystem. We're going to start off with primary producers. So a primary producer is the first producer of an energy-rich compound that are later used by organisms. They're basically going to be your first organism in the pyramid that we'll get to later. When you're doing a food web, they're going to be the first thing that you have an arrow pointing away from. In this case, it's going to be plants, algae, and certain bacterias. They are autotrophs. Autotrophs, so auto means self. They make their own food. All right, make sure you understand that autotrophs are the primary producers. They make their own food. They do not feed off of anyone else. So when it comes to energy, whereas animals will get their energy from eating plants or eating each other, um, the producers actually get their energy from the sun for the most part. And they do that through photosynthesis which we will talk about in depth later on. You're actually looking not just for sun energy, you also have chemosynthesis, which is basically just using other chemical energy. So here are your main forms of the chemical energy. When you use anything not light, and it's in the form of a chemical, then you will actually be going through this instead. So consumers, we're on the second level now. These are heterotrophs. They do not make their own food. They eat the ones that either make their own food or each other like we talked about so in most cases it's going to be animals like snakes dogs otters whatever there's also scavengers they technically are also consumers so make sure you understand that these are going to be more like vultures so if something's already dead and has been left over from another killing they will go and actually pick at it then you have the decomposers which are like bacteria and fungi which will break down anything left over from scavengers and feed it into the soil. So your types of consumers, you're going to have your herbivores, which are going to be the ones that eat leaves, roots, seeds, and fruits. Your omnivores that are going to eat everything. Your detrivores, which are going to eat detritus particles. Detritus particles is just a fancy word for saying dead things. So any dead particles from decay, they're going to tear it apart feed it back into the soil, and then it's going to come back. All right? So these are going to be from things like earthworms. So food chains and food webs. You guys should be very familiar with these, especially if you're in biology right now. So in a food chain, energy is going to flow one way. So the point of these arrows, just so that you understand and don't make this mistake on a test later on, the arrow isn't just here to tell you that, yeah, this fish eats that algae. It's there to tell you that the fish is getting the energy from the algae. Each of these arrows represents energy flow in a system. In a food chain, it is one-way energy flow. Um, in an aquatic food chain, like the one that you have right here, this algae specifically would actually be called phytoplankton. So the food web is going to be a little more complicated. You're going to have a whole bunch of different things interacting with each other. They have one here for you guys to see. So yeah, you can have something being a primary consumer and a secondary consumer at the same time in food webs. Like I said, food webs are more complicated. It's not as straightforward as a food web. So when we get to it in a second, you'll see the level of consumers that they can be. One consumer can be multiple, can fill up multiple levels. Now, in this slide, when we're looking at the actual stuff right here, are in only one of the examples of small swimming animals, and these are going to be phyto, a zooplankton. So not phytoplankton. Phytoplankton, phyto, photosynthesis, that's a plant. Zooplankton, zoo-like animals, that's an animal. Make sure you know the difference. So the trophic levels and the ecological pyramids. So when we're going through the trophic levels, you're going to end up with th this pyramid, your ecological pyramid. Now the way that this works is it's going to show you, let me see, the actual flow of energy. Now a plant gets all this energy, they'll get all of it from the sun, but when it goes to the first level of consumers, not all energy is going to transfer. They're only going to pass on 10% of whatever the plants originally had, and then it's going to go 10% and only 10%.
Now the way that this works is the organisms on the higher levels are going to be using energy to breathe, to move, to reproduce, to do the basic functions of life. So they're already wasting energy, whereas a plant just kind of sits there and does its thing. Mm, um, just to make sure, understand only 10% energy flows from one level to the other. If you were to have a question on the test, we wouldn't make it this straightforward. You need to understand this specifically. 10% is the key for this. You need to understand this specifically, the amount that actually flows from each trophic level to the next. Now you have your biomass pyramid. Now, let me make sure that I'm going to the end because I can move on faster. So in the biomass pyramid, basically in this specific one here, this is how many plants you would need in order to sustain this specific level and so on and so forth. So you see where here I may have thousands of plants, here I only have a couple of tiny animals. It's like me telling you that, it's not like, it is me telling you. You would get more energy from a salad than you would if I gave you a cheeseburger because this would provide you with more energy. Remember, if this is giving you 10% and this is giving you 10% and this is giving you 10% of whatever they got from all these, this one at the end has the most energy. So recycling in the biosphere. The main part of this is you're gonna go through bi um, biogeochemical cycles. Nothing, nothing in biology will ever go to waste. This is true of water, nitrogen, carbon, energy, like you guys saw, it always comes back. So these are going to include the water cycle. You're going to go through the carbon cycle. And the nitrogen cycle. Now I'm not going to go through it with you guys. I'm attaching a video to this actual recording so you guys can see it. The main takeaway for the whole side of the slideshow as a whole is basically for you guys to see that everything is recycled. But so that you guys can actually get the visual representation because these slides kind of don't help me show you guys that. I'm going to attach the video now. The nutrients that life needs. What are the billiard balls of life? Well, a good mnemonic is schnapps. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. If we organize that into the five cycles, We've got the water cycle, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, and sulfur cycle. So why do we need all of this matter? We're filled with water. We also use the oxygen to release energy and transfer energy with the hydrogen. We're built out of macromolecules. That's what carbon is the building block of. The nitrogen and the sulfur are both big components in the proteins that make us up. And then the phosphorus is found in DNA, RNA, and the ATP. And so if we don't have these nutrients, if we don't have these atoms, then life can't exist. So we need to pull them out of our environment. So let's start with the water cycle. How do plants get water? They're going to take it in through their roots. What about a cow? They're simply going to drink the water. But how does it move through the abiotic parts of our planet? First of all, we're going to have evaporation off ocean lakes and streams. And then we're going to have evapotranspiration. So it's evaporating, but also it's being transpired through the leaves of a plant. It's now moving from a liquid to a gas. What eventually happens is that we're going to have condensation in the clouds, we have precipitation, and then we have runoff over the surface and through groundwater, and the whole thing begins again. If we start with carbon, how does a plant get carbon? It's going to be through photosynthesis, both in plants on land and then phytoplankton that are going to be found in the ocean. What about an, a, an animal like this cow? It simply gets the carbon through its diet. It eats the plant. Or if something eats a cow like you, it's ta you're taking the carbon from the meat of the cow. So what happens to that carbon? It's eventually released through cellular respiration, goes back into the atmosphere again as carbon dioxide. So a lot of that carbon is going to be in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Now we can also take that carbon and it can be covered by rock and we can create coal and oil, fossil fuels. So we're storing that carbon in the rock. We can extract it again by digging a well and then we can have combustion where a factory releases that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere and the whole cycle continues again. 
The nitrogen cycle is a little different. Most of the nitrogen is going to be found in the atmosphere as nitrogen gas. And to get it into the living systems, we have to do nitrogen fixation. So there are bacteria that live lots of times on the roots of plant in these nodules, and they're converting the nitrogen in the atmosphere into usable ammonia. We can also put ammonia on our fields as fertilizer, and then it's going to be assimilated. In other words, plants are going to take it in through their roots, and we are going to get it from plants simply by eating them. Now, how does it get returned back to the atmosphere? It's kind of complex. What happens is we have death. We then have decay. And so bacteria or fungi are going to convert that nitrogen into ammonium. And then we have other bacteria, nitrifying bacteria, that are going to convert that ammonium into nitrites and then nitrates. Now, the nitrates can be leached. They can move into the water supply of our planet. Remember, nitrogen is a limiting nutrient. Plants Life is just waiting for nitrogen to be there. And once we get nitrogen, for example, in this stream, you'll get an algae bloom. We'll get a bunch of algae growing really, really quickly. Now, that seems like a good thing, but all those algae are going to quickly die. And eutrophication is this process by which they die, and then other bacteria have to break them down through respiration, and it consumes all of the oxygen. So it's not healthy for that water supply. But let's keep watching the nitrogen. How does it get back into the atmosphere? We'll have denitrifying bacteria that are going to return it back into the atmosphere, and so the whole thing can begin again. Now, the phosphorus cycle is going to turn more slowly. It starts by having rock that have phosphorus being uplifted lifted, we then have weathering and erosion, and that's going to move the phosphorus into the soil, into the water supply. We could also add fertilizers, that's going to have phosphorus, and the whole thing, since it's limiting, can promote eutrophication. What happens to the phosphorus? We then have assimilation where it's taken into plants. We can eat the plants and we get it. What eventually happens is we die. So through excretion and decay, we return that phosphorus into the water supply. It eventually works its way to the ocean. And then it eventually settles out in these sediments. And so it never goes to the atmosphere. It becomes part of these phosphate rocks, which are then uplifted again. And so it takes a long time for this cycle to turn because we don't include the atmosphere.